Hey guys. All right. Today, Suzanne Collins, Gregor and the Curse of the Warm Bloods, book three. We're starting it. I'm going to read one chapter. I will have to do it in two parts. YouTube doesn't like it when it gets too long, apparently. I don't know. So we will begin. Chapter one. Gregor stared in the bathroom mirror for a minute, stealing himself. Then he slowly unrolled the scroll and held the handwritten side up to the glass. In the reflection, he read the first stanza of a poem entitled The Prophecy of Blood. As usual, the lines made him feel sick to his stomach. There was a knock on the door. Boots has to go, he heard his eight-year-old sister Lizzie say. Gregor released the top of the scroll and it snapped into a roll. He quickly stuck it in the back pocket of his jeans and pulled his sweatshirt down to conceal it. He hadn't told anyone about this new prophecy yet, and he didn't intend to until it was absolutely necessary. A few months ago, okay, so some time has gone by since the end of the book, second book. A few months ago, right around Christmas, he had returned home from the Underland, a dark, war-torn world miles beneath New York City. It was home to giant talking rats, bats, spiders, cockroaches, and a variety of other oversized creatures. There were humans there too, a pale-skinned, violet-eyed people who had traveled underground in the 1600s and built the stone city of Regalia. The regalians were probably still debating whether Gregor was a traitor or a hero. On his last trip, he had refused to kill a white baby rat called the Bane. For many Underlanders, that was unforgivable, because they believed the Bane would one day be the cause of their total destruction. The current queen of regalia, Nerissa, was a frail teenager with disturbing visions of the future. She was the one who had slipped the scroll into Gregor's coat pocket when he was leaving. He had thought it was the prophecy of Bane, which he had just helped to fulfill. Instead, it was this new and terrifying poem. So you can reflect on it sometimes, Nerissa had said. Turned out she'd meant it literally. The prophecy of blood was written backward. You couldn't even make sense of it unless you had a mirror. Gregor, come on, called Lizzie, rapping on the bathroom door again. He opened the door to find Lizzie with their two-year-old sister boots. They were both bundled up in coats and hats, even though they hadn't been outside today. Need to pee, squealed Boots. <clears throat> I lost my place, sorry. Need to pee, squealed Boots, pulling her pants down around her ankles and then shuffling to the toilet. First get to the toilet, then pull your pants down instructed Lizzie for the hundredth time. Boots wiggled up onto the toilet seat. I big girl now. I go pee. Good job, said Gregor, giving her a thumbs up. Boots beamed back at him. Dad's making drop biscuits in the kitchen. The oven's on in there, said Lizzie, rubbing her hands together to warm them. The apartment was freezing. The city had been clutched in record-breaking lows for the past few weeks, and the boiler that fed steam to the old heating pipes could not compete. People in the building had called the city, and called again. Nothing much happened. Wrap it up, Boots. Time for biscuits, said Gregor. She pulled about a yard of toilet paper off the roll. You could offer to help, but she'd just say, No, I do it myself. toilet paper thing makes me think of now how people were kind of buying a lot of it so now you can't really get it and you have to be very conscientious of how much you use. Gregor made sure she washed and dried her hands then reached for the lotion so he could rub some into her chap skin. Lizzie caught his sleeve as he was about to squeeze the shampoo bottle. That shampoo! She said in alarm. Almost everything alarmed Lizzie these days. Right, said Gregor, switching bottles. We have jelly, Grigo, asked Boots, hopefully, as, she massa as he massaged the lotion into the backs of her hands. Gregor smiled at this new pronunciation of his name. He'd been Gigo for about a year, but Boots had recently added an R. Grape jelly, said Gregor. I got it just for you. You hungry? Yes, said Boots, and he swung her up onto his hip. 
A cloud of warmth enveloped him as he brought Boots into the kitchen. His dad was just pulling a tray of drop biscuits out of the oven. It was good to see him up, doing something even as simple as making his kids breakfast. More than two and a half years ago as a prisoner of the huge bloodthirsty rats in the Underland had left his dad a very sick man. When Gregor returned from his second visit at Christmas, he brought back some special medicine from the Underland. It seemed to be helping. His dad's fevers were less frequent, his hands had stopped shaking, and he had regained some weight. He was a long way from well, but Gregor's secret hope was that if the medicine kept working, his dad might get to go back to his job as a high school science teacher in fall. Gregor slid boots into the cracked, red plastic booster seat they'd had since he was a baby. <clears throat> she drummed her heels happily on the chair in anticipation of breakfast. It looked good, too, especially for an end-of-the-month meal. Gregor's mom got paid on the first of every month, and they were always out of money by then. But his dad served each of them two biscuits and a hard-boiled egg. Boots had a cup of watery apple juice. They were trying to make that last. And everybody else drank hot tea. His dad told them to start eating while he took a tray of food to their grandma. She spent a lot of time in bed, even when the weather was milder, but this winter she'd rarely left it. They'd put an electric space heater in her room, and she had lots of quilts on her bed. Still, whenever Gregor went in to see her, her hands were cold. Jelly! 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 said Boots in a sing-song voice. Gregor broke open her biscuits and put a big spoonful of on each. She took a huge bite of one, immediately, smearing purple all over her face. Hey, eat it, don't wear it, okay? said Gregor, and Boots got a fit of the giggles. You had to laugh when Boots laughed. She had such a goofy, hiccupy little kid laugh, it was contagious. Gregor and Lizzie had to hurry through breakfast so they wouldn't be late for school. Brush your teeth, reminded their dad as they rose from the table. I will, if I can get in the bathroom, said Lizzie. <coughs> Excuse me, grinning at Gregor. It was a family joke now, how much time he spent in the bathroom. There was only the one bathroom in the apartment, and since Gregor had taken to locking himself in to read the prophecy, everybody had noticed. His mom kept teasing him about trying to look good for some girl at school, and he pretended she was right by doing his best to act embarrassed. The truth was, he was thinking about a girl, but she didn't go to his school. And, she, and he wasn't worried about what she thought of his hair. He was wondering if she was even alive. Luxa. She was the same age as him, 11, and already she was the queen of regalia, or at least she had been queen until a few months ago. Against the Regalian Council's wishes, she had secretly flown after Gregor to help him on the mission to kill the Bane. She had saved Boots' life by taking on a pack of rats in a maze and allowing his baby sister to escape on a devoted cockroach. But where was Luxa now? Wandering lost in the Deadland? A prisoner of the rats? Dead? Or had she by some miracle made it home? And there was Luxa's bat, Aurora. And Temp, the cockroach who had run with Boots. And Twitch Tip, a rat whose nose was so keen, so sharp, so good, she could detect color. All his friends, all missing in action, all weaving through his dreams at night and preoccupying his thoughts when he was awake. Gregor had told the Underlanders to let him know what happened. They were supposed to leave him a message in the grate in his laundry room, which was a gateway to the Underland. Why hadn't they? What was going on? Not knowing about Luxa and the others, trying to decipher the mysterious prophecy on his own, the combination of these things was driving Gregor crazy. It was a huge effort to pay attention in class, to act normal around his friends, to hide his worries from his family, because any hint that he was planning to return to the Underland would throw them into a panic. He was constantly distracted, not hearing people when they spoke, forgetting things, like now. Gregor, your backpack, said his dad as he and Lizzie headed out the door. 
Think you might need that today. Thanks, Dad, said Gregor, avoiding his father's eyes, not wanting to see the concern there. He and Lizzie took the stairs down to the lobby and braced themselves before stepping out into the street. A bitter blast of wind went right through his clothes as if they weren't even there. He could see tears spilling out of Lizzie's eyes. They always watered in the wind. Let's hustle, Liz. At least it'll be warm at school, said Gregor. Okay, I'm going to stop there.